thank you to all of you and also to our guest speaker today, Mirage Patel, one of Julia and my uh, favorite guests. Mirage was on early 2020, oh. mid somewhere in there. So it's been a it's been a while, but you know, it's like riding a bike. We're just going to pick up right where we left off and we're going to know exactly what to do. But Mirage is here to talk to all of us and to teach Julia and I a lot more because we always learn from you how recurring giving really works. So that's the conversation that Mirage has brought to our proverbial table today. We're excited to have that. We, of course, are excited to be here and want to make sure that you know who you are looking at or listening to. Julia Patrick is here, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of The Raven Group, and we are esteemed to have the continued support of our presenting sponsors. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. These companies are here to help you Yes, you, no matter where you are, do more good in and around and throughout your community. Please check them out. Not quite yet, but in about 28 minutes, we would love for you to do that because we have Mirage here, Mirage Patel, again, co-founder, Harness Giving. Welcome back, our friend. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We are thrilled to have you here because when Jarrett and I first started out, we had a mutual contact from, I think your alma mater, um, Lander University, who said, hey, there's this really amazing young guy in Florida who's come up with this technology. You need to talk to him. And so we're like, okay, yeah, we're gonna do this chat for about two or three weeks. What the heck? And now three years later, your company, three years later, wow, what an amazing story. And so it's really exciting to have you back Mirage, really exciting. Thanks so much. This is episode four from yours truly. So I'm excited. Fantastic. Uh, Fantastic. Well, let's dive into this because I remember, you know, talking to you about this conversation, but let's get down to the very granular level. What is recurring donations? And then how do recurring donations work? Absolutely. I think, you know, when we first started these conversations three years ago um, in the midst of the pandemic, um, I wanted to really nail the fact that recurring giving is not anything but a solution. So to really understand recurring giving, you have to understand the problem that it solves. And so many nonprofits and many organizations that we work with continue to tell us, um, you know, having this Uh, confidence in these revenue streams, having sustainable revenue streams, not having to worry about the pressures of what's happening in the macro environment, right? The the market uh, state of of the market today is is having a bunch of folks worried about how how are these things going to impact our bottom line and our ability to fundraise over the course of the year as consumers and the American population continues to get um, hit by all of these external factors. So the problem is, is that we need to have dependable, recurring, strong revenue streams that help take the pressure off of us in hitting our number, whatever number that may be, it's different from every organization, that annual goal um, each and every year. If we can figure out a way to not come into every year with zero dollars, then it inevitably helps us to grow. Because if you've got let's just say 100 donors giving you $50 a month, you're coming into every year with $60,000 and not starting at zero, but starting at uh, you know, a place where you can grow that number and, and continue to do all these different things to help you boost that number up. So recurring giving is not a program. Folks start, tend to say, hey, oh, we have a monthly giving program. We've checked that box. It's much more than that. It's a mindset shift. It's It's you and your team taking the initiative to say, hey, we're not going to be a transactional fundraising shop anymore. We're not going to be in this perpetual cycle of spending time and dollars conducting these one-off campaigns to satisfy our short-term goals. Rather, we're going to move our mindset to a relationship-based approach and focus on the donor's post-conversion experience. If we know that this donation is going to come in and it's going to come in in an automated fashion and we can count on it month after month, there's a powerful shift that happens. It's no longer about how do we drive this donation, 
But now that we have it, how do we create such a great experience from our donors that their value over time, their donor lifetime value will continue to increase? Um, so it's a subtle change, but it's a powerful one. Okay, but I, I want to stop really quickly. And I would ask you, if, if those folks that um, engage in this, it seems to me, and I'm not just talking about your product, Harness Giving, it seems to me like this is the foray into an automated system. Are, are you seeing that, that a lot, of, a lot of organizations have not really embraced the digital side of what can be? And this is how they're getting into it? Or am I off on that? No, I, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And thankfully, the industry, um, and, and it goes way beyond just Harness, but yeah. all yeah. of these different platforms that, that um, the organizations are using and, and we use every day, these technologies are starting to become table stakes. So the idea that the technology is holding us back is no longer valid. Um, and, and so from an automation manner, from a recurring donation standpoint, recurring payment standpoint, this is table stakes. Your platform, whatever CRM you're working on with, whatever fundraising platform you're working on, um, these are things that they've built in with intent and with purpose so that this, the, the hardest parts, what used to be, uh, Julia, we were just talking about, recurring giving used to be going to a breakfast once a quarter and making sure everyone filled out the, right. the, the donation form with their credit card number. And then the back <laughs> office management of typing that number in yeah. and Lord forbid a card fails or a lost card and you lost that donation. Yeah. Well, technology has helped to bridge that gap. So that's no longer something to fall back on. Um, there are technologies available, technologies available at different price points. So any organization, no matter the size, can really embrace a new platform to help them to achieve these goals. Yeah. Okay. You know, yesterday's episode, Mirage, was with your part-time controller, Ellie Hume, and we talked about grant writing and how, you know, really the myth in the nonprofit sector is, well, you just get funded through grants and really how... <laughs> dangerous that could be, you know, and so looking at this individual giving, looking at recurring donations, diversifying or funding models with their relationship and that return on relationship from these individual recurring donations, as you said, that is actually a lot more forecastable, if that's even a proper word, <laughs> than these grants, you know, that we we submit, we pray and hope that they're funded. Um, they're never truly guaranteed year over year. So you're still starting at the baseline of zero, but recurring donations, you do not. And so having that steady, you know, lifeblood is so critical. So let's talk about, you had mentioned the, the value of these donors and the value of their investment can you help us learn how we can establish the donor value and the value gap that you talk about? Absolutely. Um, and I think, again, to try to understand why some of these things matter, you have to take a, a look at the macro level. First of all, mm -hmm. consumers, we just happen to call them donors in the nonprofit space, yeah, but consumers true. are being conditioned to behave in certain ways throughout the entire for-profit space. So whereas we have this term donor fatigue, I tend to believe that now with all of the different um, marketing appeals that are being made, not just the nonprofit sector, but the for-profit sector, every time the share of your eyeballs as a consumer um, is fatiguing you in all different areas, in all different ways. And what for-profits have done so well is there's a clear value proposition for every dollar you spend on a product or service, right? You go to a car dealership, you're looking for a car, you trade your money for a car. You go to a fast food restaurant, you get the value meal, you know you're going to trade five bucks for a burger, fries, and a drink. You go to a salon and you pay, you know, a hundred bucks for a shampoo and a haircut. Oh, you know oh wait, wait, go higher. $200. <laughs> I don't know what the going rate is today. But, um, but you get the point that yeah. I know as a consumer, how what value I'm being driven in return for my incremental dollar that I spend with a vendor, with a service provider, or with a different business. And as a you know, as that value is, is, is um, communicated, clearly the for-profits have things by way of leverage that they're able to run, say, promotions this, uh, uh, this month at the salon. We're going to, um, you know, for $250, we're not only going to shampoo you and cut you, but we're also going to color your hair for you. And you hear a consumer say, that's such a great deal. And before you know it, 
all of those uh, uh, appointments are booked out and, and the salon is, is, is having a great day. When's the last time you heard a donor respond to an appeal saying that's such a great deal? Yeah. Never. <laughs> it I doesn't love happen. It. You know, God, Mirage, I want part of your brain put into my head. <laughs> you are right. I would say the only time uh, is a matching gift, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pressure, but. And that's a, that's a great example. And that is explaining value in a different way. And so um, I, that's, that's a phenomenal example that I, even I hadn't thought of, but matching gift is, 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 is wonderful in the way that it gets people to move. And, and this is proven out, right? So why do matching gifts work? Why do you get the, the, the buy-in from your donor base? Because they see the value. If I put a dollar in, this organization is going to get $2 out. This makes sense to me. And so if you're continuing to run donation appeals without trying to explain the value and, and you're not bridging this value gap, then that's where the issue comes in. And, and, and I'll go more than just philosophical. So folks say, well, what is the value? Well, you've got tangible value, you've got intangible value. Intangible is connecting your dollar to the, um, the mission that it drove, right? So your dollars created X amount of return for uh, our, our services or our mission. And that's something that we, we are doing, many organizations are starting to grasp and understand the, the power of stewardship. But where uh, organizations are still dropping the ball is there's also a lot of tangible value. And, and it goes from the basics, like people love t-shirts. Tell me how much it costs you to print a t-shirt, 10 bucks. You sell them for 25 bucks. People love t-shirts. That is a tangible piece of value. All of these organizations, we're all throwing events um, from you know, uh, happy hours to small uh, bowling tournaments and play shooting and golf uh, all the way through these big galas. Well, just chart this out on your whiteboard. How much is the cost to us to pr provide a dinner at the gala for each individual guest? Say it's 25 bucks. Well, that is value that you have as an organization. And if you start to chart all these things out, what you're going to see is you actually have a lot of products and services from a nonprofit standpoint that you can offer your donor. So if I map all this out and I say, hey, my cost of goods sold, all these tickets and everything like that that I pay for out of pocket is $100. Well, I can take that cost of goods sold. I can assign an ROI that I want from it. So I want to make 5X. So my cost of fundraising is no more than 20%. So now I've got a $500 package that I can offer a donor. Chop that in 12. This is a $40 a month ask. And included in your subscription to my nonprofit, I am never going to A, solicit you via email again, everything is gonna be stewardship. And all those events that I used to ask you to pay to attend, I'm gonna send you a ticket because you should be there, you deserve to be there and we're gonna celebrate you. And what I'm doing here now is, now anytime I receive a piece of communication from the organization I'm so passionate about, I don't have that underlying fear that the ask is about to come. Everything is all about now stewarding me. I've already paid my dues, I've already paid for this, uh, this value. And, and that shift in a donor mindset is super powerful. Now I'm coming to this event super pumped because I'm celebrating you know, me and how I was able to push this, uh, this mission forward. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And it also drives into you know, the whole psychology of fundraising and going back to that match gift. You know, why does that work? Well, it's, it's the value proposition. It is the psychology of fundraising. And I think when we talk about the psychology of fundraising, you know, when we look at this and just putting a value on people, putting a value on basic human needs, right? Like many of us come from a, a place of privilege where we are very grateful to have food, clothing, and shelter, right? We all deserve that. So when you talk about the value of providing food, clothing, and shelter to someone else, wow, what a great value that is, right? Like, so we could get really deep on this matter, Mirage, and, and I know that we we literally could, and I, I think mm -hmm. that's fantastic. It makes so much sense, and I don't see nonprofits Not doing implementing this, or if they do, they're like barely doing it, you know? They're really, they, they don't go all in. They just, they think, well, we'll try it, but they don't commit to that value conversation. 
I, I agree. And, and let's be empathetic for a second. None of this stuff is easy per se, right? Why do we tend towards grants? Because, Thank oh, you. we can pay a grant writer to produce these grants. It's easy. Yeah. Like, just get there's this off a recipe. the recipe. Yeah, right? there's a exactly. recipe for it. So, so I'm truly empathetic towards the fact that this stuff is not easy, but the hard things are beautiful in the sense that if we can take the right steps towards them, the outcomes become so valuable that it was totally worth it in the first place. Yeah. So yes, I hear organizations all the time talk about, well, you're telling me about this value gap, but I don't have any, what, what, what value can I provide? Well, you're already doing these things. It's just about mapping out these magic moments. That's what we call them internally for the donors. So, hey, you're, 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 you're signing up to be part of this cohort of donors that we uh, label as our champion donors. It's $40 a month. We're going to send you a t-shirt on month one. On month two, you're going to get the update of exactly how your dollars move the needle, right? This is something we spoke about um, a few years ago of nonprofits have uh, 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 ability to um, drip dopamine, right? Like this is crazy. It's the chemical reaction that happens yes. in a person's brain yes. when they understand that they have helped somebody else or helped move a different mission forward. And yes. you're just talking about this, uh, uh, Jared, of it makes you feel so good if you can provide the basic human necessities for another living person, an animal, um, a child, their health, um, education, whatever the category is, you have the innate ability. If you can nail that, that communication um, to drip that, that, that dopamine, right? So now you got a t-shirt month one, you've reinforced your donation by getting an update month two. Now month three is our first quarter's event. I'm getting a ticket to this thing. They're not asking me to buy a ticket. They're saying, hey, you are part of our cohort of monthly donors. Here is your ticket. We look forward to coming out and celebrating you and sharing with you more of the work we've done, right? And you do that 12 times over the course of a year. And all of a sudden you've got a donor that in year two, why would I leave? Why would I stop my gift? It, it feels too good. I'm part of this mission now. Yes. And yeah. so, okay, so let me ask you this. Um, it's. It's so logical and it's so methodical, but on the other side of that communication, you're looking at a donor who might not have ever experienced this type of a structure. Mm -hmm. How do they get thrown off or, or, or are they like, wow, this organization isn't doing it right because nobody else is. Do you see what I'm saying? Like how, how are donors in this new structure or new approach, I should say, mm -hmm. responding? Yeah, so I think, again, you have to give a nod to who are these donors. These donors are people, and anytime they do business with a, any other entity other than a nonprofit, they are labeled a consumer. Okay. And all of these consumers True. are being conditioned already. The for-profits are spending the dollars and spending um, the, the time and effort to condition these consumers to embrace these new experiences, right? Recurring uh, uh, payment models and, and subscription business models have evolved over the past decade. So yeah. the consumers have heightened expectations. And, and, and the way we nail this is you don't have to be tacky about it. You don't have to you know, address every dollar to uh, an outcome. But if you can provide enough of these magic moments yeah. and surprise your donor with these really cool, hey, we're not asking you to buy something. We're just asking you to come out and support and have a great meal on us. And we're going to do all the same things we already do. We don't have to change much. It's just how we're asking for the payment. We're not asking you for 10 different payments over the course of the, of the year. Hey, take part in our crowdfunding campaign. Hey, text to give. Hey, uh, buy a ticket to our event. Instead of asking you and fatiguing you dozens of times a year for, for donation asks, we're just asking you to commit one time. Commit one time and now me and my coworkers and my team can go away from asking you for money and tiptoe in that line and just giving you a fantastic experience. Um, and that is the key differentiator of the two models is I don't need to ask you. The payment is there now. It's automatic. We can expect it. So now I don't that I don't need to spend my time tiptoeing and trying to frame a new ask in a new creative way every single quarter, every single month all that time and energy goes to making sure you're having a great experience. And, and most importantly, that our dollars are actually moving the mission forward. Uh, let's not forget about the fact that on top of the fundraising layer, we actually have programs and services that we need to drive forward. And that's where the majority of our time should be spent. 
So the entire time, the entire year, you just continue to roll out the red carpet for this person, right? And having these experiences and exchanges, one of the things we've talked about a lot over the last two years in particular is ROR, return on relationship. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about, you know, rolling out the red carpet, that's focused on that relationship, just just like you've said. Um, I, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because I have a question that I, I want to throw out at you here. Um, recurring donors is different than a pledge commitment, correct? And are you able to, to talk a little bit about that? Because um, pledges are done multiple times, right? Uh, kind of different uh, depending on what that looks like. But from my understanding, a recurring donor and a pledge commitment are accounted for differently. Can you speak to that, Mirage? Yeah, and, and so I would like to preface with the fact that these definitions do skew organization to organization. Okay. Um, so um, I would argue that a pledge um, actually would fall into the recurring donation umbrella as long as the pledge has an element of recurring to it. So we're, we're collecting pledge cards when we're, um, you know, going and, and soliciting or having these breakfasts or having these events. We're collecting the pledge cards. Well, how are those asks being uh, construed, right? Are they one time, hey, uh, make, a, make a, a pledge for this year only? Is it make a pledge over the next three to five years? Because again, if you make a $25,000 pledge over a five-year term, that's a recurring gift. That's right. It's a 5k a or annual recurring gift and and you can boil that down and and what that means is this revenue is guaranteed over the course of X amount of term. Uh, and and from that lens and from the true definition of what a recurring gift entails, I would totally count that. Uh, and and now again, what you've done internally is you've taken a prospect off the board. They're now a customer. They're now a donor. Yeah. And now you just focus on providing them with a great experience rather than continuing to put them in the same segment of net new dollars. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, we warned everyone, including ourselves, that this time's going to go by really <laughs> fast. One of the things that I'd love for us to wrap up here is some of these best practices. And you've shared a few oh, wow. in each of these conversations already. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you that might've joined us earlier, this is Mirage's fourth appearance on the nonprofit show. So if you like what you're hearing, make sure that you do check out our archives and find the previous episodes. But finish us up here, Mirage, when, like, what are some best practices? Just give us something that we know we can sink our teeth into and say, okay, I'm drinking from the Kool-Aid. I'm all on board. What do I need to do? Absolutely. One of my favorite trends that's, you know, it's happened uh, historically, but it's, I'm seeing it more and more now is ways of, in which we can extend uh, um, perceived value to our donors. Uh, so one of these ways that I've seen and, and folks are really starting to run with it more and more is, first of all, let's start with the macro. I love starting with the macro because everything we do should have a rhyme and a reason attached to it. Macro level, we live in a purpose-driven economy. Everything across the board, especially over the past few years with everything humanity has gone through, has led us to become people that want more than just a paycheck, want more from making purchases and uh, yes. doing business with folks than just, hey, a good or service in return. I want to make sure that everything I do aligns with a, a larger purpose. So humanity is experiencing this thing. People are being conditioned to understand what purposes are. Um, B Corporation is a thing. These are all leading indicators that something has happened in the macro space. Well, how do you capitalize on that? Well, you create perceived value opportunities. One of those things is I've seen a lot more of these young leader councils, yes. these organization yeah. roundtables. And really, this is brilliant because what you're doing is you're taking 100 people out of your database and you're saying, we have tapped you um, to be a part of this new group yeah. of thought leaders, industry leaders, uh, young professionals that are, are being invited to, to help, on, help us on this journey to extending X, Y, or Z mission. Mm -hmm. So now what you've done is you've taken 100 people You've put a label on them that they can now add to their LinkedIn. They can add to their social medias. Right. Oh, I am a, a young, you know, entrepreneur council member, or I'm a young, you know, uh, Ronald McDonald House calls this their red shoe council. You, right. no matter if there's a brand to uh, this, this group or not, you can create your own. 
And what you've done is you've taken a hundred people, you slapped a label on them, you've made them feel good, like, oh, I'm a thought leader now, and I can really help come to the table and help move these missions across. And you're actually um, getting this new group together that you can uh, maximize the value on by making them recurring donors, et cetera, et cetera. So from a, from a management standpoint, I really like that. I think it's it's brilliant. I think uh, it checks all the boxes for what's in it for me from someone that you tap in to be a part of that. And then secondly, um, what really cost is associated with that? It's a cost of time, a cost of having a quarterly meeting where you bring these people to the table. Now they're they're inviting their peers to events. They're participating in all these other campaigns as well. So I love that. Um, and then from a technological perspective, I know we spoke about that earlier as well. These basic payment options and things like that are table stakes across all platforms. And, and, and one of the things that I hear a lot is, again, likening recurring giving to just a program. It's not just a monthly giving program. Recurring giving is an embodiment of this new spirit of the way we do business. Mm -hmm. So one of those things that we hear a lot is, oh, we really like your text to give capabilities. Sometimes that irks me a little bit because why are we with constituents that have already given us a donation in one form or another in the past? Why is our default to say, hey, we're gonna use a, a new communication mechanism like text. Why is the default, we should use text to get more dollars? Why can't the default be, we should use text to be able to extend this mission, extend that value, extend um, the, the, the uh, stewardship, right? To firm up that relationship. We should use these new technologies in ways that we're thinking above and beyond just driving the next incremental dollar. I want to use text to give not, or I want to use text not to get new dollars. I want to use text to make sure that I'm stewarding my donors that on their random Wednesday morning or Thursday morning, they're getting a message from me saying, Hey, while you slept last night, your dollars helped us to accomplish this. Yeah. That's going to make me have a fantastic day, no matter what that message looks like. Right. Uh, that so attitude of gratitude goes such oh. a long way. And still speaks to rolling out that red carpet time after time after time. Much of this can be automated. Much of this, you know, as you've said throughout this conversation, Mirage is really something that imagine, imagine removing that fear of when is the next ask coming, right? And so really focusing on attitude of gratitude constantly, you know, over and over as they walk this experience with you on the red carpet and, Fantastic. Wow. Wow. Have we missed you, our friend. Uh, so <laughs> great to have you back. Mirage Patel, co-founder, Harness Giving, harnessgiving.com. Please check out uh, this company, this man. Fantastic. Uh, wonderful wisdom. I, I love, you know, how you dive deep into this conversation and into this space, Mirage, because you really are disrupting in a really fun, juicy way. So thank you for that. Thank you, guys. I appreciate um, you inviting me back. And one shameless plug that I will mention is Instagram, harness underscore giving. Um, our Instagram is dedicated to being very empathetic towards the struggles that we as fundraisers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm confident that if you join us and follow us, we'll help to brighten your day by way of sharing some of those, those uh, frustrating moments and bringing an angle of, of, of uh, you know, comedy to those. So check yes. it out. You'll, you'll immediately see what I'm talking about. And, oh, uh, your, the levity in your Instagram posts, they, they do brighten my day. It's like getting that Wednesday morning text while you slept, this is what happened. So, yeah. you know, a lot of tongue in cheek, which is fantastic to see. So thank you for that shameless plug. <laughs> No problem. Thanks. Hey, you know, Jarrett and I um, are so grateful that we have these moments. Um, this is one of those times it's really confirmed because we met this young man when we were all trying to figure out what was going to be happening with the world, with our own businesses, with all of these things we've talked about. And it's so cool to see you have really moved through it to be successful. Um, I would say Jarrett and I have moved through it and we've, you know, embraced what the, has come our way. And so we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Again, uh, three years into this, more than 500 episodes, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, and Vimeo. And last but not least, so many of these sponsors called us personally or showed up in the very beginning when 
None of us knew what was going to be going on, and they are still here moving through. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Nerd Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and Staffing Boutique. Without these folks, their investment and their commitment to us, we would not be here. Wow. Okay. You have like harnessed my passion for this industry, my friend, Miraj Patel. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we like to end each and every episode, we want to say stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.